Hello, my heathens, and welcome back to Spinning the Wheel Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Angus, and in this episode, we're going to be working with the Beltane season, Gemini, New Moon, Solar Eclipse... (laughs) <laughs> so many words. Uh, this is Lunar Week 17, for those of you who are collecting the whole card set. Uh, this week, we will be looking at the lunar phases, astrology, tarot, and holy days of June 10th through June 16th. My heathens, you will be shocked to know we have a lot going on this week, so let's get into it. The wacky good times start this week on June 10th with a new moon solar eclipse in Gemini at 19 degrees. Uh, This will be exact at 3.52 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and later in the night or day uh, for everyone else around the planet. This eclipse is a solar eclipse, in case we didn't say that, (laughs) and it is specifically an annular solar eclipse. So what is that? Um, An annular solar eclipse can only take place when we have three things kind of lining up all together, like the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. Oh my god. Okay. One, it has to be a new moon. Two, at the same time, The moon is at or very near a lunar node. And we know that the nodes of the moon have been in Gemini and Sagittarius for some time now. So this new moon is taking place very close to the lunar node. Um, And the moon is at its furthest point from the Earth, which is called apogee. This is the micro moon or the mini moon. Um, In contrast to the moon being at perigee, which it was two weeks ago for the full moon. And that is when we get a super moon. And that's when the moon is at its closest point to the earth, more or less. So we have these three things. It's a new moon. It's a new moon really close to the node. And it's a new moon that's close to the node that's also at apogee. So at its furthest point away from earth. And what this creates is the annular solar eclipse. An annular means to form a ring. And so... What this ultimately means is that parts of the world will be able to see the ring of fire style total eclipse. Um, the the image of the, the beads of fire along the sides are sometimes called Bailey's beads. Here, if you are in the U.S., um, this is going to be a partial eclipse for us. Uh, other people around the planet will be able to see the complete ring of fire. Um, so pretty dramatic. Very cool. Um, Our next solar eclipse is in December, and that is a total solar eclipse, meaning that the moon is going to be at perigee. It's going to be at its closest point to us, so it's going to block out the entire sun. Um, And that is taking place at the end of Samhain season. Um, And I'm pretty sure that that's going to be the last eclipse in the Gemini Sagittarius situation because I'm pretty sure that the nodes are going to officially move backwards into Taurus and Scorpio by the time we have our next eclipse in 2022. Okay, so that's the science of the eclipse. That's what's going on with that. Now let's talk about the magic of working with a solar eclipse. There's a lot of conjecture around do you do magic on a solar eclipse or do you not do magic on a solar eclipse? And you know me, I'm all about giving you the facts and the histories of stuff and then also my opinions about things. So I will say that opinions and um, the the magical theories out there are very split. There's a lot of conjecture, as I said. Um, in traditional practices, especially when we look back into um, the rituals and the cosmology of ancient civilizations, it's a big no for the most part. A lot of people, a lot of civilizations were um, really freaked out by solar eclipses. They were not thought of as good. They were looked at as very inauspicious bad times, an omen of bad times, that sort of thing. A lot of that comes from folks not understanding what was happening in the planetary mechanics, and a lot of it comes from maybe they did have some sense of understanding of planetary mechanics and astronomy, um, but they still didn't think it was a good idea that their great luminary was being blocked out in the sky. So let me give you, I guess, four different opinions about 
doing magic on the solar eclipse in general. And then I'm going to give you my opinion on doing magic on this particular solar eclipse. So opinion one, eclipses always take place during the new moon when the sun and the moon are in the same sign. They are together in the sky and their energies are combined and it's supercharged. And so you have all of this big blast of energy in this one sign, or we could also say in this one house uh, in your chart. And so you've got this like great generator of power and energy there. Another opinion is that an eclipse gives us the energy of an entire cycle of seasons or an entire cycle of a day from twilight to darkness, from dawn to light, and from the waning light of autumn um, to the darkness of winter, to the growing light of spring and the brightness of summer. So this is a really powerful energy to harness to bring about changes very quickly. Something that would, uh, you know, a magical practice um, or a process that would normally take an entire year or an entire month or an entire day. In theory, you could move through that entire process in just the few hours that it takes for the eclipse to occur. Another opinion is that the moon engulfs the sun, it turns the sky bloody red, but then the sun emerges again as a symbol of rebirth. Um, and so this is another way that you can kind of experience a, a an eclipse, is this idea of washing away the old to make way for the new and breaking down barriers um, and coming out into the light. And last but not least, uh, opinion or theory number four on this is that since the moon is in its dark phase and it is blocking the sun, um, it's, uh, it's kind of looked at like both energies are being blocked and thus unavailable. And so both the sun and the moon's energies are kind of on pause for a moment. And so whatever magical uh, practices we might be trying to do, we're doing them without the assistance of the moon and the sun. So those are sort of the four main opinions. And I should say that that last opinion uh, definitely resonates closely with a lot of the ways that ancient civilizations looked at solar eclipses as well. It was like the sun is gone. So this is an inauspicious day to try to get stuff done. Um, again, these are all various theories, right? Um, and I am a big proponent of free will. I'm a big proponent of modern magical practices, chaos magic, um, adaptation. <laughs> I have a lot of mutable signs in my chart. So, you know, <laughs> I'm a big fan of change. Um, and, and my opinion on this is that uh, we actually have some really fun and interesting and cool and lively uh, astrology this week. We also have some really funky and heavy astrology this week. But it's a new moon in Gemini. It's a solar eclipse new moon in Gemini next to the nodes. It's the it's the last time we're going to have a big hurrah here with the north node being in Gemini. This is the end of se the belting season, the end of spring season. And I have intuitively feel like um, this might be a really great new moon to invite in some guidance around um, or information or musings around, you know, what are the changes that I've gone through over spring, especially with our last year, year and a half of wild life here on planet Earth. Um, and what might be expected of me? What are the things I might ha need to be starting to um, get ready to commit to as we move into summer and we move into Letha season? And then beyond that, as usual, I highly recommend that you listen to your intuition. If you feel like doing stuff that day, do it. If you don't want to, don't. Um, you know, if it feels funky, don't do it. A lot of uh, different civilizations are like, you're not even supposed to look at the eclipse. So, you know, I, I would say like, consider all of these various magical theories, consider why it is that a group might think one way or the other consider your own magical paradigm and then, you know, go forth. <laughs> okay, now <laughs> that we have talked about what an eclipse is and how we might work with the solar eclipse from a magical standpoint, this is also a new moon. So let's talk about that. <laughs> this is the new moon. This is our fifth new moon by some lunar calendars. And this is our last new moon of Beltane season and spring.
as we have talked about before with this this particular phase of the moon we are working with birth and incarnation and awakening energies beginnings um this is the seed in the dark um and this is a, a fantastic moon here this new moon in gemini fantastic moon for satisfying our curiosity um, acquiring knowledge that is as inspirational as it is informative or if you cannot handle like sticking your nose in a book and and in fact i should say this this is not a, a, a great moon for like let me dig down and get real academic about stuff and listen to some dry ass boring lecture if you're going to listen to a lecture it's got to be somebody that's like super entertaining and stomping around on stage and giving a really great performance <laughs> that kind of a thing but if that stuff is not speaking to you just finding your crew and like going and getting into some shenanigans and some hijinks absolutely perfect and completely appropriate for the new moon in gemini <laughs> The astrology of this day really supports that kind of goofy activity as well, whether it's, you know, some sort of entertaining education or just running around with your pals. Um, the sun is in Gemini and it is uh, conjunct Mercury retrograde at 20 degrees on this day, which of course is also pretty darn close to where the moon is. So we could basically say that this new moon solar eclipse is also conjunct Mercury retrograde. <laughs> this puts a pretty heavy emphasis on travel, self-expression, um, self-examination. Um, things could feel very chatty, very electrified. You might feel very restless on this day. You might find yourself taking lots of short trips from one place to another. Uh, maybe this is a coffee house crawl or a park crawl or a pub crawl for you. Um, but it's also a day that you might see just an incredible amount of communication. You might be sending a million text messages. You might be receiving a million emails. Suddenly it's like everybody is like, oh my God, I got something to say and I got to find a group of people to say it to. <laughs> um, okay, so the other stuff that we are doing with our new moon in Gemini. We want to talk about the lunar body and we also want to talk about working with the natural world. For our lunar body on new moon in Gemini, we want to be engaging in activities that strengthen or increase or build or improve or beautify or activate the shoulders, the arms, the elbows, the wrists, the hands, and to a lesser extent, the lungs. Side note, not a doctor, not giving you any medical or health advice here, so do things that are safe and right for you, please and thank you. For working with our natural world, we are harvesting, we are introducing insects that might help with pest control, and we are weeding for growth. And if you've got just like a few houseplants inside of your 700 square foot apartment, let's be real, it's probably a 500 square foot apartment you know, in the middle of the city and you're like, I'm weeding for things? What are you talking about? Um, this is also, again, a great night for harvesting. Um, day and night, I should say, the couple, the, the few hours that the moon is in Gemini. Great time for harvesting. And harvesting might be that you go to the park and you pick a few things ethically, you know, again, I want to stress ethical harvesting, but it might be that you end up at the co-op or the grocery store and you're harvesting herbs there. <laughs> like, it's just a really good night for for gathering herbs for magical practices in the future. All right, let us get into the holy days of June 10th. <laughs> All right, with this new moon, we have three different months starting. We have the oak tree month from the Celtic slash Druidic tree month calendar. We have Skiroforion, starting from our Greek ancestors, and Calende Iunus, or Junius, um, from our Roman friends. Um, so let's take a look at this tree month of oak. Very interesting, I think, to have uh, this month be associated with the tree oak, because of course, for Wiccans and some pagans and heathens and witches, um, the end of Beltane and the end of spring brings the end of the Oak King's reign. Um, he has, or they, have had their six months of kind of running the show, and now the Holly King is going to show up and 
sacrifice them, kill them, or just trade places with them and sort of take over the show. Um, so I think it's an interesting thing. It's sort of an interesting and kind of cool homage to um, this god archetype that has been guiding us and protecting us from winter into now the high point of the year where the earth is blooming and producing lots of fruit and we don't have to put forth a lot of effort to like keep ourselves alive and safe and healthy in general <laughs> um because you know the 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 cold and the winter isn't actively trying to kill us <laughs> um and so it's almost this sort of like thank you and and last hurrah of the oak king um this falls when uh, a time when the trees are beginning to reach their full blooming stages. The Celts called this month Doyer, which some scholars believe means door, and it might be the root word of the word, excuse me, the root of the word Druid. Uh, the oak is connected with spells for protection, strength, fertility, money, and success. And interestingly enough, these are all themes that we are to see in other holy days around the planet throughout this week. <laughs> um, and good fortune. Uh, carry an acorn in your pocket. When you go to an interview or a business meeting, it will bring you good luck. If you catch a falling oak leaf before it hits the ground, you'll stay healthy the following year. Okay. The other two months that are starting this this now with the, with the new moon is uh, Skiriforion from the Greeks and Calende Ionis or Julianus uh, from the Romans. Skiriforion um, is uh, from the Athenian calendar. This is not necessarily a month that was recognized all over Greece in all of its many eras. Um, but it marked the last month of spring and the final harvest of the grains and the big festival of this lunar month is Skira, which we will talk about uh, next week, I believe. Um, but yeah, uh, as we've talked about previously or in the last couple of weeks, harvest festivals have actually already started for the cultures, uh, ancient and modern, that are very, very close to the equator. Um, they actually have to harvest their grains and their crops before it gets too hot. And the raging power of the intensity of the heat and the sun kills off the crops because there's just not enough water and not enough rain to keep things hydrated versus folks that are in uh, temperate places or closer to the poles. Um, the closer we get to the solstices, um, the closer we get to being able to plant things and start our growth process. So it's kind of cool. I love that there is that paradox and that dichotomy between all of the different cultures of earth all doing something at the same time, all in some part of the process. Okay, I'm going off here. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, the Calendae Iunus from Romans, this is the fourth month in the Roman calendar. It equals to June. And the big celebration for this lunar month will be um, Vestalia and Metralia, which we will talk about in a little bit. Other stuff happening on this day. The ascension of Jesus. Um, Christ physically departs from earth by rising into heaven in the presence of 11 apostles. Totally happened, swear to God. According to the New Testament narrative, the ascension occurs approximately 40 days after the resurrection. Um, you will find lots and lots of the Christ ascension holy spiffy cycle that happens throughout the year for Catholics have a lot of 40 day and 46 day markers. Um, these are uh, more or less the same amount of days as the um, eight seasons of the year. Uh, it matches up to the wheel of the year very nicely. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Other stuff happening on this day. The Dies Natalis of the Temple of Juno Moneta from our Roman ancestors. Now, we have a lot of Dies Natalis this month. So let me just say, before we get into all of the rest of them, a Dies Natalis <laughs> was basically the birthday of a temple uh, for a particular deity or a spirit or an archetype or an entity. Um, and usually what happens on the birthdays of the temple is that the temples are opened up 
emptied out, cleaned out, swept out uh, the goddess or the god or the archetype that is venerated in the um, temple is zhuzhed or refreshed in some way. Sometimes a plaque or a statue or a something of the deity is taken to a body of water and washed. That's a pretty frequent thing. Um, sometimes their old clothing from the last year is taken off and new clothing that has been prepared is put on so they have a brand new frock for the next year. Um, literal sweeping and cleansing of the temple will take place. So we see a lot of that type of stuff. Um, now, Juno Manetta is uh, an interesting name because this name actually refers to two different deities. Um, it was first the name of a goddess of memory. Um, and in Greece, she was identified as Nemozine. And from her name, we actually get the word meme. Um, and then eventually it was an epithet of Juno, Juno Moneta. And in that name uh, is where we get words like money and mint, Moneta. Um, and so Juno Moneta, an epithet of Juno, was the protectress of funds. And accordingly, money in ancient Rome was coined in her temple. But I think it's very interesting that we have somebody here that is connect or an entity a name an idea that is both connected somehow to money and monetary experiences and memory at the same time because money and merchants and exchange of money comes under the auspices of mercury which is of course the ruling planet of gemini and so does memory memory is connected to the entity uh thoth or toth from the egyptian pantheon and <laughs> so very interesting connection here and of course a goddess that is literally the root of memes so if you are a meme maker on the internet you might like light a candle to nemesine on this day also stuff that's happening on this day the Dies natalis of the temple of mars we know what that means now. Okay. The Dies Natalis of the Temple of the Tempestates or Tempestates. Uh, this is also from our Roman ancestors. The uh, Tempestates were um, the season, weather, bad weather, storm, and tempest goddesses. Uh, they were goddesses of storms and sudden weather, as with certain other nature, nature and weather deities, rainbows and clouds um, should be regarded as divine. Um, and uh, these uh, characters were consecrated as deities by the Roman people. Um, it's Rainbows have a very interesting um, magical place. I think it's cool that we have a goddess connected to rainbows here in the month of June. Hello. Uh, all right, let's move on. We also have the festival of Karna from our Roman ancestors. Why do I have so many Roman holidays in here? Because the Romans wrote down everything. It was incredibly well documented. Also, they destroyed a lot of the stuff that came before them. So it's difficult to find that information. Um, Karna uh, is a goddess from Rome, and uh, this was her feast day. Now, it's, this is important because Carna's feast days were marked as nefastus on the Roman calendar. In other words, this was a public holiday when no assemblies or court or fancy official business could take place, no legal stuff could take place, all of that stuff. Um, the one of the things that we had, do know about this festival in particular is that mashed beans and lard a dish perhaps to be compared to something like refried beans or hop and johns were offered to her as a uh, res divine or food for the gods um, and thus this day was also known as the bean calends um, since at this time, the bean harvest was also maturing. Uh, beans had lots of magico-religious properties in ancient Greece and Rome, in addition to their importance as a food crop, makes you wonder about the roots of the story, Jack and the Beanstalk. Hmm, let's move on. All right, June 11th, the moon moves into Cancer just after midnight pacific standard time as all the times are in this podcast and it will be more or less conjunct venus in cancer how sweet and lovely um 
This is our uh, waxing crescent in Cancer. And don't forget, waxing crescent means to increase. Um, we are overcoming inertia. We are focusing ourselves for the coming process. And we are recognizing how much the old process might still be pulling on us, how much the past might be pulling on us. Um, and so we are that new shoot that is struggling to find the surface of the soil. As the waxing crescent moon passes through the sign of cancer, we come back to some work that we have been doing over the last couple of months. And let me say this also, this is the last time um, that we are going to experience the waxing crescent can in cancer phase for about a year. Um, so we're coming back to this work that we've been doing over the last couple of months, um, especially around uh, places where when we were kids and especially with family where we really got the message that we didn't fit places where perhaps we got a message around basic parts of our nature being unacceptable or parts of us that might be or should be repressed or should be changed um as I have said in the last couple of months, and I'll say it again here, these are some parts of us that need to be brought out into the light and given some love and given some acceptance, especially here in Pride Month. Hello. Um, we won't experience this particular lunar phase for about another year, as I said. So, you know, I know it's uncomfortable work and we've been doing this for a few months in a row now. So maybe this time it's not so heavy. Um what I would offer here is like, just maybe ask yourself, where am I with this work? And what new opportunities does this progress afford for me? For our lunar body, we want to be engaging in activities that strengthen, increase, build, beautify, improve, or activate our chest, our lungs, our breasts, and our stomach. And for working with the natural world, we want to be planting, we want to be transplanting, or we want to be grafting, especially when we want to be uh, working with plants where we are encouraging above ground growth. Also on this day, Mars moves into Leo. Pleasure seekers to the dance floor, please. Pleasure seekers to the dance floor, please. Our personalities will be sparkling and dynamic and we want to get involved and play the starring role, at least more so than usual. Um, this is a really great day to kind of follow your heart and like really give in to the enthusiasm. We might be really feeling super confident and self-assured. Um, and for some people that's going to come through as like an increased sex drive for other folks that's going to come through as just an increased drive to like get out into the world and let folks know just how freaking awesome you are. So kind of a cool <laughs> piece of astrology after that really wild new moon the night before and solar eclipse. Um, our holy days of this day, we have two things more or less happening on this day. We have the heliacal rise of Bellatrix, um, which is a star in Orion. And I haven't been talking about the fixed stars. I'm going to a little bit more. Um, why I wanted to mention this in particular is the modern name Bellatrix is Latin for female warrior. Uh, and it's also called the Amazon star, which comes from the Arabic name Al-Najid, which means the conqueror. An even older Arabic name for this star means the lion. And I just think it's interesting um, because we have other warrior stuff happening this week that here's Bellatrix up in the sky. Also on this day, Feast of the Sacred Heart from our Catholic friends. This is always on a Friday uh after the second sunday after pentecost and going back um fridays are ruled by venus so anytime that we're insisting that a, that a holiday has to be on a friday it has something to do with venusian goddess energy of that type um uh this holiday can occur during beltane season or letha season um, the devotion to the Sacred Heart is one of the most widely practiced and well-known Catholic devotions, and this is taking Jesus Christ's physical heart as the representation of his divine love for humanity. What a cool dude. Moving on to June 12th. 
All right, the moon is still in Cancer, and it is still conjunct Venus in Cancer, um, which really encourages socializing, shopping, beautifying yourself or your environment or really anything, hanging out with loved ones. If there's anything to watch out for with um, stuff being conjunct Venus at any time, um, it's that we can engage in overindulgence. So that's all. I mean, too much of a good thing is really kind of the, the risk that we take on this day. However, um, Venus is not just hanging out with the moon. Venus is also square Chiron on this day and sextiling Uranus on this day. This combination could be really electrifying. It could be really wild. Um, Chiron, in all of its helpfulness, really can bring up a lot of pain from the past. It can bring up a lot of old wounds for us. Um, that is, in fact, part of its medicine. <laughs> and a lot of times why it's bringing up an old wound is to show us ways that we maybe are being held back by ultimately old beliefs attached to these old wounds. And on this day in particular with Venus in Cancer, squaring Chiron in Aries, um, this can manifest as tensions with loved ones who want things for you that clash with what you think you deserve. But from the end of you underestimating yourself and them saying, no, we see the potential in you and you could be doing so much more. Um, and so bringing up old wounds in that way, you know, of somebody saying, wow, I really actually have a lot of faith in you. I have a lot of, uh, you know, I, I see all this potential in you. And you're like, wow, I don't see all this potential in myself. Holy moly, what is this? So it could be a little bit of that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and then uh, with the Venus sextile Uranus, um, wherever we are feeling social, wherever we are feeling like we want to be hanging out with people and doing stuff in the world, we are looking to break away from our daily routine. We are looking for things um, and places and people and situations that are very stimulating. You know, maybe it's a great day to buy a new vibrator. Uh, ultimately, this is a day for new friends, for flings, and for short friendships, um, whatever that means for you. Stuff we are celebrating on this day. On this day, we have the heliacal rising of Capella, which is a star in the constellation, the Charioteer. What? That's not a zodiac sign that we work with. No, it isn't. But the sign of Cancer, which we will be heading into when we hit Letha and summer solstice season, is connected to the Chariot card in Tarot. Hmm, moving on. Also on this day, we have from our Greek ancestors, Eraphoria. This is a festival that was very important and had a lot of different parts. And unfortunately, at this point, we have lost a lot of the details around this festival. It was ultimately dedicated to Athena, during which two young girls dressed in white garments, which we've already had a lot of at this time of year, carrying unspoken things, AKA things which nobody could speak about, <laughs> if that wasn't clear. Um, uh, possibly some of the clothing of Athena. Um, and they carried these unspoken things at night from the Acropolis down to the gardens of Aphrodite. Um, and then they carried something else back up to the Acropolis and, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. A lot of carrying things around. Maybe there was morning dew involved or the wetness of the goddess. Uh, there could be a lot of metaphor here. Also on this day, we have the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Bellona. We, of course, already know what the Dies Natalis is all about. Who was Bellona? Well, this is a Roman goddess dedicated to war. Her main attribute is the military helmet worn on her head. She often holds a sword, a spear, or a shield and brandishes a torch or a whip as she rides into battle on a four-horse chariot. She's connected by name and right to goddesses like Kybel, Ma, Enyo, and Virtus, who we talked about last week. This brings us to June 13th. And the moon enters Leo. This is still in a waxing crescent phase. 
Um, and when the moon is in Leo in this waxing crescent phase, really the very best advice I can give you is go do some silly shit. Go watch funny movies with friends. Go play pranks. Go play in the park. Um, just go be silly. Go do silly stuff. Go be a clown. Go have a good time. Like, get your yayas. Get some chuckles in. Get some freaking laughs in. Um, hang out with friends. Tickle parties. You know, the whole gig. For our lunar body, we want to be engaging in activities that strengthen, improve, build, increase, activate, or beautify our heart, our back, our circulation, and my little side note is our hair. Because when the waxing moon is in Leo, what better time to deal with our mane, <laughs> our beautiful mane, than, on, than on, at this time. Um, for the natural world, uh, this is a fantastic night for harvesting, um, introducing insects for pest control, weeding, and pruning to encourage growth. So if you have house plants that are really leggy because of the spring growth, this is a great time to prune them back um, to encourage really bushy growth. Um, or if you want them to get longer, prune them in that way so that it encourages their length. But this is a really great moon for that either way. While the moon is hanging out in Leo, however, we have the sun in Gemini squaring Neptune and Pisces at 23 degrees. This may manifest for you as feeling very low energy. Um, so if it's at all possible for you, take the day off, go play. You know, it very much sits with the, the moon being in Leo, like a day to be silly. Sun squaring Neptune is not a day to like try to be technical or try to be super driven or try to be super like aggressive about things. It's literally the opposite. This is like, keep it simple, sweaty. Um, you know, stuff that doesn't require drive, doesn't require courage. <laughs> and a way of working with this is, you know, reveling in the fantasy, right? And enjoying all of that. Um, but really kind of coming to a place in your magical work or your spiritual work where you sort of consider the similarities and the differences between the context, the, the concepts of something being fantastic or fantasy based versus something being unrealistic, right? And, you know, there's a lot of things I think that a lot of us want for the world and they sound fantastical at this point. And to other parts of ourselves and other people in our lives, they sound just downright unrealistic. And so this is a great day, like if we do wanna do this kind of work, if it isn't just about partying or goofing off with friends and having a good time, um, if we do have an introspective moment, it could be around this kind of stuff around, you know, feeling the difference between something being fantastic and something being unrealistic. And so I just encourage you to, to do that work if it feels right, but also try not to get discouraged by the gap between those two things. All right, our holy days for this day. We have the heliacal rising of El Nath, which is a star located at the tip of the northern or left horn of the Taurus constellation. Yes, even here, this late in the year, because of the precession of the equinoxes and sidereal and all that, yes, we are still dealing with stars that would, in theory, be within the constellation of Taurus, but they are no longer. Um, also on this day, we have uh, from June 13th through June 26th, the Okodu Women's Rites of Passage Festival from the Yoruba Land peoples. I'll just be straight up. I know that... that this holiday or this festival is listed in a bunch of different calendars around the internet and there is very, 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 very little information on it. So I'm just going to leave it with this. There is a women's rights festival at this time or women's rite of passage festival at this time. Um, if you are curious about this, I would encourage you to go find uh, a Yoruba priestess or priest um, in your community to teach you about this. Even if you don't practice the religion, just if you're curious about it, go find somebody and pay them to teach you because I do not practice this religion. Um, I'm just letting you know that this is happening at the same time as all of this other stuff. Uh, okay. Also on this day <laughs> is the Feast of Epona. Um, this is a Celtic holiday, ancient Celtic slash modern pagan. 
Um, Epona was known as Rhiannon in Wales. She is Maka in Ireland. And for the Gauls, she is Epona. This is a horse goddess who is also connected to stables and horse owners. She is the guardian of agriculture and transportation. And in addition, Epona has been associated with birds and her birds were said to have the ability to put the living to sleep and to rouse the dead. She has also been pictured with cornucopias and baskets filled with fruits, especially apples, and thus she has also been linked to fertility. She is often portrayed riding a horse, next to a horse, or surrounded by several horses and feeding foals. In parts of Central Europe, she is believed to be a magical white horse that brought shamans to the spirit world. Epona translates as divine mare or mare goddess, and I think we would be remiss if we did not mention Epona, of course, is the mother of twins. What? <laughs> You can't make this stuff up, you guys. I mean, somebody did ultimately make this stuff up, but <laughs> but look at how it all fits together like a cute little puzzle piece. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> Also on this day, we have All Souls Day from Tibet. Uh, in Tibet, worshippers in Buddhist temples make fa chan, or boats of the law, out of paper, some very large, which are then burned in the evening. The purpose of the celebrations is twofold, to remember the dead and to free those who are suffering uh, in the uh, bardos. Also on this day, we have the Feast of St. Anthony from our Catholic friends. TLDR, let's just get to the stuff that St. Anthony is the patron saint of. We have this interesting list. Books, bread, the infant Jesus, cute, lilies, fish, flaming heart, mules, lost items, lost souls, and lost people, the runts of the litter, horses, harvests, fishermen's, mariners, oppressed people, pregnant women, shipwrecks, travelers, watermen, and runts of the litter. Lots of stuff that we are talking about at this time of year already. Also on this day, we have Holy Wells Day in Ireland. There are around 3,000 holy wells in Ireland. Since early times, these have been seen as places of prayer and healing. To become aware of how precious water is, um, visit a local holy well and pray for the protection of water. Plan with others how you can protect the water in your area. Just last week, we had uh, World Oceans Day. So this week, we have have a few different um, water holidays and um, this is just another one of those. We're coming out of Gemini into cancer season, which is of course our first water sign of the year. We're going to see lots and lots of oceanic goddess holidays coming up in the next month or six weeks or so. Um, so this is sort of a preamble to all of that. Also on this day, we have Dies Natalis of the Temple of Hercules Magnus Custis. This is from our Roman ancestors. Um, Hercules Magnus, a.k.a. the Great, um, mostly just honored with ludi or games, gambling and, and just, you know, being raunchy, fart and burp and scratching their nuts, that kind of stuff. Uh, two interesting things about this <laughs> festival. One, uh, men only were allowed, and we'll get to that in just a second, but it was only men allowed, and um, they all had to bring meat as, like, a sacrifice, but also no meat could be left on the altar by the end of the ceremonies, and so everything that was brought, the men had to eat all of it. <laughs> and part two, how this festival came about was... Hercules was, I don't know, out doing something, being a guy, doing things. And he came across a festival and asked for some water and wanted some of the, like, ablutions and, and food off the altar kind of situation. And one of the priestesses was like, no, this is a, a festival for this particular goddess. And, like, you know, men aren't really allowed. And he was like, oh, well, I'm going to have my own festival where women aren't allowed. So we literally have the... the the first holiday of male fragility. Here it is. Isn't that cute? Isn't that precious? Aw, light a candle for poor old fucking Herc. Moving on to June 14th. Okay, the moon is still in Leo, so you're still all about your hair. The, the astrology of this day is funky, so let's just say that. Um, this is the Saturn 
retrograde in Aquarius square Uranus in Taurus at 13 degrees that some astrologers have been talking about coming up. This is the second of three of these squares that these two planets are doing this year. It's tense. It, it, it's a lot of tension and it's kind of an overriding astrological theme for this entirety of 2021. It's sort of happening in the background of a lot of other things that are happening. So what does this look like? How might this be manifesting for you? rigid patterns getting called out almost like a test to see how you handle chaos you might experience some shit this week that leaves you thinking do i even understand what the fuck is happening in the world um we need in our lives both structure and change but usually our lives are built on a paradigm that is structure dominant not change dominant, right? So you might be really questioning this week situations that limit you or hold you down, environments, people, relationships, all of that stuff. And at the same time, wary or like freaked out or destabilized um, by the changes that it seems like it will take to move past the limitations, right? So at, on one end, we're like, ah, I don't want to be limited in this way. But on the other end, we're like, I don't know if I want to change in the way that it seems like it would be required to get around this limitation. Ugh. Depending on which side of the conversation we find ourselves, we might be experiencing tense relationships with folks in positions of authority or folks that represent radical change in our worlds. Or both, if we're really lucky. My heathens... The point is not to throw it all out the window. When facing our fears around change, I encourage you to examine the stuff in your life that's causing you to fall short of your potential. There's probably some stuff that is completely outside of your control. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the parts that are under your influence. Be brave and show some love to the garden of yourself. Pull out the damn weeds that are keeping you from really growing. All right, our holy days for this day. Vidar's day from the Norse. Vidar is a god among the Aesir associated with vengeance. This is the son of Odin and the Jotun, or the giant, uh, Greider, and is foretold to avenge his father's death by killing the wolf Fenir at Ragnarok. Also on this day is the birthday of the Muses. In Greek tradition, the goddess Nemozine, who we just talked about a couple of days ago, gave birth to the Muses on this day. The Muses are the nine creative spirits. Calliope, who was the goddess of epic poetry. Cleo, the goddess of history. Euterpe, the goddess of flutes and music. Thalia, the goddess of comedy and pastoral poetry. Melpomene, the goddess of tragedy. Terpsichore, the goddess of dance, Erato, the goddess of love poetry and lyric poetry, Polyhymnia, the goddess of sacred poetry, and Urania, the goddess of astronomy. The Dragon Boat Festival from our Taoist friends. The Dragon Boat Festival originated in honor of a man named Ku Yan, who was a poet and a statesman and a minister to the Zhu Emperor. Kuyan ended up being exiled. When the Zhu were defeated by the kin, Kuyan in despair threw himself into the Milu River when, uh, on the fifth day of the fifth month. Um, in his last poem, he said, Many a heavy sigh I have in my despair, grieving that I was born in such an unlucky time. I yoked a team of jade dragons to a phoenix chariot and waited for the wind to come to soar up on my journey. Upon hearing of Kuyan's suicide, the local fishermen paddled out to their, their longboats, beating drums and throwing glutinous rice balls into the water so that the fish wouldn't eat his body. Since that time, people have commemorate, commemorated this day by celebrating the anniversary of his death with activities that include dragon boat races and the eating of these yummy rice balls. Because Kuyan was a great poet, um, this day is also celebrated as Poets Day. Very interesting to me that we have on this very same day, you know, all of the muses that are, you know, responsible for poetry within this, this time period of Gemini, which is about writing and communication and all of that stuff. Okay. Also on this day, Dies Natalis of the Temple of Phidias Dias. 
Uh, this is from our Roman ancestors. Uh, Deus Fidius, uh, or Fidius Deus, both ways, a god of oaths associated with Jupiter. His name was thought to be related to Fides, who was a goddess of trust and bona fides, or good faith in Roman paganism. She was one of the original virtues to be considered an actual religious divinity. Uh, Fides is everything that is required for honor and credibility from fidelity in marriage to contractual agreements and the obligation soldiers owed to Rome. We've already seen a whole bunch of like fealty to the Roman state type stuff over the last several weeks. So here's a little bit more of that. Ultimately from this goddess's name, we get the word fidelity. And that brings us to June 15th. And on this day, the moon enters Virgo. And so this is a uh, first quarter or waxing half. We've kind of used both of those terms. And in this stage of the moon's cycle, we are wanting to kind of move into a decision phase. We want to act, we want to build, we want to establish our roots. Um, we want to figure out our headquarters and we want to get to doing, we want to rise to the occasion. At this phase, the moon is square to the sun. So there is a little bit of tension here in the, in the lunar cycle. And the cycle is saying, okay, it's time to make some moves and get out of the concept phase and into the doing phase. Um, or our momentum has a, a, a possibility of collapsing back in on itself. So when the moon is waxing in Virgo in this particular phase, uh, this is a great day for doing some accounting, checking the money books, the finances, getting the bills paid, send an extra 20 bucks to pay down the principal on your credit cards. Um, it's a great day for getting into the details of your finances where you might normally not have the patience for that kind of tedious stuff. You might have it today. Very interesting to me that we have this lunar phase Virgo moon here with the Juno Moneta uh, holiday earlier in the week. <laughs> I love these coincidences. It's so cool. Um, okay. For our lunar body, while the moon is in waxing in Virgo, we want to be engaging in activities that strengthen, increase, beautify, activate, improve, or build our digestive organs and our nervous system, whatever that means for you. Again, I'm not a doctor other than Dr. Love. So, you know, do things that are healthy and safe for you. Um, for working with our natural world, in the past I've been like, leave your plants alone on Virgo moon, and it's true. We're too nitpicky about things, and it's a great day to like be, be too severe with whatever it is that you're trying to do to your plants. But I think, especially with the, um, the whole lunar phase of this week starting out with the new moon in Gemini that has this curiosity and like, let's learn, let's gather the facts. I think that this could be a really cool moon to do some research for your plants. Um, you know, are there better things for them? Or do you have a problem and there's something you're trying to correct? And, or this might be a really cool day to go to like a, a plant shop that carries really fancy, weird plants or to the conservatory where you can go see stuff that you would normally not get to see. Um, Virgo is really detail oriented. It loves research. It wants to look at the most granular level of things. And so, you know, being able to apply that to um, your plant world and your natural world might be really, really cool. All right, let's look at the holy days for June 15th. And we start off with the heliacal rising of the star Al Heka, which is located on the tip of the southern horn of the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Interestingly enough, this star has been called the Southern Star Bull Horn since ancient Babylon. And also very interestingly, in China, the name for this star means Celestial Gate. And that ties in very closely to another name for the constellation of Cancer, which is the Gate of Man. Uh, okay, June 15th through June 18th, we have the Raja Puja from our Hindu friends. This festival is also called Mathuna Sankrati. Um, this is a three-day long festival of womanhood celebrated in Odisha, India. The second day of the festival signifies beginning of uh, the solar month of Mithuna from which the season of rain starts. This is literally a menstruation fest. It is believed that the mother goddess earth 
or the divine wife of the Lord Vishnu undergoes menstruation during the first three days. On the fourth day, um, it's called Vasumati Snana or the ceremonial bath of Budevi. Uh, the term Raja comes from the Sanskrit word Rajas, which means menstruation. And when a person menstruates, they are called Rajaswala or a menstruating person. And in medieval times, the festival became more popular as an agricultural holiday marking the worship of Bedevi, who is the wife of Lord Yaganath. Um, a silver idol of Bedevi is still found in the Puri temple beside Lord Yaganath. Interesting correlations here. Silver, of course, always connected to the moon and the goddess and cancer. And Yaganath is a, a deity that we are going to talk about in Letha season, and they are depicted in these massive massive chariots their word that that deity's name is where we get the word juggernaut from moving on suijin matsuri from our shinto friends is also happening this day this is the uh, a, a matsuri that is dedicated to the shinto god of water in japanese mythology the term suijin literally water people or water deity refers to the heavenly and earthly manifestations of the benevolent shinto divinity of water it can also refer to a wide variety of mythological and magical creatures found in lakes ponds springs and wells including serpents, snakes, dragons, eels, fish, turtles, and even the flesh-eating kappa. Of course, these are all symbols that we've been working with so much over the last few weeks and will continue to as we move into cancer season and letha season and the start of summer. Also on this day, we have Vesta Aperitur from our Roman ancestors. This is the day that the Temple of Vesta is opened to the public in anticipation of the massive festival Vestalia, which is about to take place in just a couple days. Also on this day from our Roman ancestors, the Ludi Piscatori. Uh, this holiday was celebrated by fishermen of Rome. The celebration was directed by the Praetor. All fish that were caught on this day were sacrificed by fire at the temple of Vulcan. Vulcan, of course, being a fire and a volcano deity, very similar and close to the work that Vesta did or does. Also on this day, Wind Power Day. This is a modern global holiday. Global Wind Day is a worldwide event that occurs annually on June 15th. It's a day for discovering wind energy, yada, yada, yada. Yay, cool. I'm a big fan of wind energy. I don't mean to blow that off. <laughs> but um, why I mention this day in particular is, hello, it's Gemini season. <laughs> like, hello? It's so good. All right. Moving on to June 16th. The moon is still in Virgo, and on this date, the sun enters Gemini in sidereal astrology. Um, yeah, we've been talking about Gemini energy and symbolism for a month now, but now it's all lining up. Woo! Okay. Also on this day, we have the Night of the Teardrop. This is a modern pagan adaptation of uh, the isis osiris cycle or the beginning of it i should say where isis uh is searching for osiris and she is crying and a single teardrop falls from her and splashes on earth and it coincides with it is meant to explain the ancient timing of the rising of the nile where the nile begins to take on more and more water it will eventually crest and its banks and flood the uh, nile delta which is the farming area for ancient egyptians also on this day night of the silver chalice this is also another modern pagan wicca oriented holiday and it's basically the same thing <laughs> it really kind of sits in the same place it's um, again sort of recognizing water energy goddess energy um and oceanic divinity also on this day holy wells day from our catholic friends we already talked about that from ireland basically the same thing it's just recognizing all around the planet of all of the many holy wells that exist uh in various civilizations 
And last but not least, June 16th, we have the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Ments from our Roman ancestors. In Roman mythology, Ments, also known as Ments Bona, which means the good mind, was the personification of thought, consciousness, and the mind, and also of right thinking. The Latin word Ments expresses the idea of mind and is the origin of English words like mental and dementia and even the group Mensa based their name off of this initially. Um, I also think it's interesting because it's the first four letters of the word menstruate, but I'm sure that's a coincidence. <laughs> Let's get into the roundup because that's it. That's our whole week. That's all. Just that. Just, just an hour's worth of information. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into the roundup. Okay, we have our lunar phases this week. The new moon in Gemini, a.k.a. also our solar eclipse in Gemini. And then we have a waxing crescent in Cancer, a waxing crescent in Leo, and the waxing half in Virgo. The astrology roundup for the week. We have on June 10th, the new moon solar eclipse in Gemini. On June 12th, we have Venus in Cancer, square Chiron in Aries at 12 degrees, and sextiling Uranus in Taurus at 13 degrees. On June 13th, we have the sun in Gemini, square Neptune in Pisces at 23 degrees, and June 14th, Uranus in Taurus, square Saturn retrograde in Aquarius at 13 degrees. And... Last but not least, no, it's not last. Um, <laughs> our holy day themes for this month. We are seeing a lot of stuff, but for me, it really makes a lot of sense. Um, so we're seeing Taurus stuff, right? We're seeing the rise, the heliacal rise of El Nath, the heliacal rise of El Hekka, which are stars that mark the horns of Taurus. But we're also seeing things like the Ascension of Jesus and the Feast of St. Anthony, which definitely have some Taurus energy to them. Um, then we're also seeing the Feast of the Sacred Heart, which falls under the category of divine love. And we have a big festival to Athena, who is kind of a Taurian goddess. And then we also have some women's festivals, some fertility festivals, and some menstruation festivals with uh, Savitri Brata from Hindu Friends, um, Okudu Women's Rites of Passage Festival from the Yoruba Land folks, and the Raja Puja, also called the Mathuna Sankrati, also called it a forgot to mention this earlier, but um, Ambubachi Mela, this is all the same holiday, very tantric, very fertility-based, menstruation-based. Um, and then we get into the, um, oh, also, kind. I guess if we want to say under Taurus stuff, quote-unquote, we've got harvest holidays like the Skidophorion month, the festival of Karna from our Roman friends, um, also the Feast of St. Anthony with the bread connection, and the Raja Puja. Um, okay, so then we have uh, what I kind of think of as Gemini stuff. Lots of it actually happening this month. The Feast of Epona, hello, all the horses giving birth to twins, you know. Wind Power Day, why not, right? Sun entering Gemini in Sidereal Astrology, yeah, I'm going to, that's connected to Gemini. What else do we have connected? We have horses, so Feast of Epona, but also that Feast of St. Anthony, that guy connected to horses. The three different holidays connected to the memory and the mind, the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Juno Moneta, the Birthday of the Muses, and the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Mens. Um, we have stuff for money with Juno Moneta. We have stuff for writing with the Birthday of the Muses, as well as the Dragon Boat Festival from our Taoist friends. Um, we have weather holidays here, Dies Natalis of the Temple of the Tempestit Tempestates or Tempestates, um, Raja Puja as well, and Wind Power Day as well, right? All connected to weather stuff. That's all connected to Mercury and Gemini. Sailing, boats, and fishing, as we've talked about for the last several weeks. <laughs> we know for sure that these things are all ruled by Mercury and Gemini. So that's All Souls Day from our Tibetan friends, the Feast of St. Anthony, the Dragon Boat Festival, as well as the Ludi Piscatori. Um, we're doing a little bit of ancestor and dead work here um, with All Souls Day and the Dragon Boat Festival. 
And then we're really pushing into warrior energy. Um, we know that the Romans really are excited to like ramp up their war campaigns at this point in the year because they've pulled in their grain harvest. The days are long. Um, you know, people don't need shelters. They can just sleep in the fields. So yeah, let's, let's have a war, right? Warriors and war stuff. We have the Heliacal Rising of Bellatrix, which connects to the constellation Orion, the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Mars, the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Bologna, as well as the Temple of Hercules Magnus Custis, history's first fragile male. Um, we also have Vidar's Day from the Norse folk and uh, St. Vladimir's Day. I didn't talk about it earlier, but he killed a bunch of pagans in Russia and brought Christianity. Excite! We have a holiday dedicated or connected to oaths and fidelity with the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Dies Fidius. Um, we have a little mention of dragons. We definitely had more dragons in the last few weeks, and we will have more dragons heading forward. And then we get into cancer stuff, um, the sign of cancer. So we have the Heliacal Rising of Alheca, the Feast of St. Anthony, which definitely connected to cancer things. We have um, three different holidays connected to chariots with the Heliacal Rising of Capella, the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Bologna, and the Raja Puja. And we have um, five different holidays dedicated to water or holy wells with the Holy Wells Day in Ireland, Holy Wells Day for Catholics, the uh, Sui Gen Matsuri from our Shinto friends, the Night of the Teardrop, the Night of the Silver Chalice. And then last but not least, we have fire um, with the Vesta Aperture um, from our Roman ancestors. So that kind of gives us a sense of like where we're at here at the end of um, coming into these last few days of the Beltane season before we switch over to summer and Letha season. We see the last vestiges of Taurus, which certainly has a lot of influence over the entirety of Beltane season. We see lots and lots of Gemini related stuff happening. And then we're starting to get our first traces of the sign of cancer, which is on the horizon and coming up next. For working with this um, new moon in Gemini in particular, and also we could think of it as this solar eclipse that's in Gemini, the nodes about to move out of Gemini and Sagittarius, you might, if you work with altars or work tables or whatever your magical work space is that you work with or use, um, I encourage you to work with the tarot cards, the lovers, as well as the magician. Um, the lovers card is connected to Gemini and the magician is connected to Mercury. Um, and they both just have a lot to say <laughs> about the energy of Beltane season and about the energy of sort of seizing our... Um, our capacity to to make things happen here in the physical world. That's one thing to just casually sort of, you know, uh, willy nilly be casting seeds out into the world. And hey, if they take, they take. If they don't, they don't. Whatever. It's just an experiment. But it's a different thing to become very determined about something and to say to ourselves and the universe, no, no, no. I am pushing this seed with purpose down into the soil because I want something to happen. I maybe need something to happen. I'm doing this with intention and I'm doing this with presence. That's a different attitude than the experimentation and the, I don't know, let's try it kind of energy that we are embodying during spring and Ostara season and Beltane season. Um, now we are leaving that experimentation behind and we are getting ready to move into Letha season, which is claiming. It's determinative. We are, we are seizing things. <laughs> We're not experimenting anymore. We are saying, no, 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 I'm deciding now. And I'm claiming this thing and I'm saying this is the direction we're going or this is the thing I'm trying to do. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We still have, you know, a week plus before we get into that. So whatever experimentation, whatever um, questioning, whatever exploration you still need to do. And of course, we can do all of that work at any time that we want to throughout the year. But we're really held right now in some wonderful astrology and biorhythms and symbology and myth and folklore that that assists us with this work um okay my friends that is it 
I hope you have a fantastic week. Next week, the sun will enter Cancer, which means that's Letha season, that's summer solstice. And next week, bum, 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 Mercury will be going direct, my friends. So finally, we can put some of the bizarro ghosts in the machine to rest. <laughs> All right. Have a fantastic week. Blessed be. I love you. Thank you so much for working with me in this stuff. It's so fun. Um, and uh, I'll see you in class, witch. Thank you.